Chapter 24 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 24 Without a Wedding Garment. The parable of the wedding garment opens before us a lesson of the highest consequence. By the marriage is represented the union of humanity with divinity. The wedding garment represents the character which all must possess who shall be accounted fit guests for the wedding. In this parable, as in that of the Great Supper, are illustrated the gospel invitation, its rejection by the Jewish people, and the call of mercy to the Gentiles. But on the part of those who reject the invitation, this parable brings to view a deeper insult and a more dreadful punishment. The call to the feast is a king's invitation. It proceeds from one who is vested with power to command. It confers high honor. Yet the honor is unappreciated. The king's authority is despised. While the householder's invitation was regarded with indifference, the king's is met with insult and murder. They treated his servants with scorn, despitefully using them and slaying them. The householder, on seeing his invitation slighted, declared that none of the men who were bidden should taste of his supper. But for those who had done, despite to the king, more than the exclusion from his presence and his table is decreed. He sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. In both parables the feast is provided with guests, but the second shows that there is a preparation to be made by all who attend the feast. Those who neglect this preparation are cast out. The king came in to see the guests, and saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The call to the feast had been given by Christ's disciples. Our Lord had sent out the twelve, and afterward the seventy, proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand, and calling upon men to repent and believe the gospel. But the call was not heeded. Those who were bidden to the feast did not come. The servants were sent out later to say, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. This was the message borne to the Jewish nation after the crucifixion of Christ. But the nation that claimed to be God's peculiar people rejected the gospel brought to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Many did this in the most scornful manner. Others were so exasperated by the offer of salvation, the offer of pardon for rejecting the Lord of glory, that they turned upon the bearers of the message. There was a great persecution. Many, both of men and women, were thrust into prison, and some of the Lord's messengers, as Stephen and James, were put to death. Thus the Jewish people sealed their rejection of God's mercy. The result was foretold by Christ in the parable. The king sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. The judgment pronounced came upon the Jews in the destruction of Jerusalem, and the scattering of the nation. The third call to the feast represents the giving of the gospel to the Gentiles. The king said, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. The king's servants, who went out into the highways, gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. It was a mixed company. Some of them had no more real regard for the giver of the feast than had the ones who rejected the call. The class first bidden could not afford, they thought, to sacrifice any worldly advantage for the sake of attending the king's banquet. And of those who accepted the invitation, there were some who thought only of benefiting themselves. They came to share the provisions of the feast, but had no desire to honor the king. When the king came in to view the guests, the real character of all was revealed. For every guest at the feast there had been provided a wedding garment. This garment was a gift from the king. By wearing it the guests showed their respect for the giver of the feast. But one man was clothed in his common citizen dress. He had refused to make the preparation required by the king. The garment provided for him at great cost he disdained to wear. Thus he insulted his lord. To the king's demand, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? He could answer nothing. He was self-condemned. Then the king said, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. 
By the king's examination of the guests at the feast is represented a work of judgment. The guests at the gospel feast are those who profess to serve God, those whose names are written in the book of life. But not all who profess to be Christians are true disciples. Before the final reward is given, it must be decided who are fitted to share the inheritance of the righteous. This decision must be made prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven, for when he comes, his reward is with him, to give every man according as his work shall be. Before his coming, then, the character of every man's work will have been determined, and to every one of Christ's followers the reward will have been apportioned according to his deeds. It is while men are still dwelling upon earth that the work of investigative judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. The lives of all his professed followers pass in review before God. All are examined according to the record of the books of heaven, and according to his deeds the destiny of each is forever fixed. By the wedding garment in the parable is represented the pure, spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess. To the church it is given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The fine linen, says the scripture, is the righteousness of saints. It is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character, that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal Savior. The white robe of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed by God in holy Eden. They lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. All the strength of their affections were given to their heavenly Father. A beautiful soft light, the light of God, enshrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. Had they remained true to God, it would ever have continued to enshroud them. But when sin entered, they severed their connection with God, and the light that had encircled them departed. Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of the heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. This is what the transgressors of God's law have done ever since the day of Adam and Eve's disobedience. They have sewed together fig leaves to cover their nakedness caused by transgression. They have worn the garments of their own devising. By works of their own have they tried to cover their sins and make themselves acceptable with God. But this they can never do. Nothing can man devise to supply the place of his lost robe of innocence. No fig leaf garment, no worldly citizen dress can be worn by those who sit down with Christ and angels at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. I counsel thee, he says, to buy of me white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ, in his humanity, wrought out a perfect character, and this character he offers to impart to us. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Sin is defined to be the transgression of the law, but Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. He said of himself, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. When on earth he said to his disciples, I have kept my Father's commandments, by his perfect obedience he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart, the will merged in his will, the mind becomes one with his mind, the thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig-leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. The guests at the marriage feast were inspected by the king. Only those were accepted who had obeyed his requirements and put on the wedding garment. So it is with the guests at the gospel feast. All must pass the scrutiny of the great king, and only those are received who have put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. Righteousness is right doing, and it is by their deeds that all will be judged. Our characters are revealed by what we do. The work shows whether the faith is genuine. It is not enough for us to believe that Jesus is not an impostor, and that the religion of the Bible is no cunningly devised fable. 
We may believe that the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven whereby man may be saved, and yet we may not through faith make him our personal Savior. It is not enough to believe the theory of truth. It is not enough to make a profession of faith in Christ and have our names registered on the church roll. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is the genuine evidence of conversion. Whatever our profession, it amounts to nothing unless Christ is revealed in works of righteousness. The truth is to be planted in the heart. It is to control the mind and regulate affections. The whole character must be stamped with the divine utterances. Every jot and tittle of the word of God is to be brought into the daily practice. He who becomes a partaker of the divine nature will be in harmony with God's great standard of righteousness, his holy law. This is the rule by which God measures the actions of men. This will be the test of character in the judgment. There are many who claim that by the death of Christ the law was abrogated, but in this they contradict Christ's own words. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. It was to atone for man's transgression of the law that Christ laid down his life. Could the law have been changed or set aside, then Christ need not have died. But by his life on earth he honored the law of God. By his death he established it. He gave his life as a sacrifice, not to destroy God's law, not to create a lower standard, but that justice might be maintained, that the law might be shown to be immutable, that it might stand fast forever. Satan had claimed that it was impossible for man to obey God's commandments, and in our own strength it is true that we cannot obey them. But Christ came in the form of humanity, and by his perfect obedience he proved that humanity and divinity combined can obey every one of God's precepts. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. This power is not in the human agent. It is the power of God. When a soul receives Christ, he receives power to live the life of Christ. God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character, and it is a standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law, and when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Clothed in the glorious apparel of Christ's righteousness, they have a place at the king's feast. They have a right to join the blood-washed throng. The man who came to the feast without a wedding garment represents the condition of many in our world today. They profess to be Christians and lay claim on the blessings and privileges of the gospel, yet they feel no need of a transformation of character. They have never felt true repentance for sin. They do not realize their need of Christ or exercise faith in Him. They have not overcome their hereditary or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. Yet they think that they are good enough in themselves, and they rest upon their own merits instead of trusting in Christ. Hearers of the word, they come to the banquet, but they have not put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. Many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists. They have refused the gift which alone could enable them to honor Christ by representing Him to the world. The work of the Holy Spirit is to them a strange work. They are not doers of the word. The heavenly principles that distinguish those who are one with Christ from those who are one with the world have become almost indistinguishable. The professed followers of Christ are no longer a separate and peculiar people. The line of demarcation is indistinct. The people are subordinating themselves to the world, to its practices, its customs, its selfishness. The church has gone over to the world in transgression of the law, when the world should have come over to the church in obedience to the law. Daily, the church is being converted to the world. All these expect to be saved by Christ's death while they refuse to live his self-sacrificing life. They extol the riches of free grace and attempt to cover themselves with an appearance of righteousness, hoping to screen their defects of character. But their efforts will be of no avail in the day of God. 
The righteousness of Christ will not cover one cherished sin. A man may be a lawbreaker in heart, yet if he commits no outward act of transgression, he may be regarded by the world as possessing great integrity. But God's law looks into the secrets of the heart. Every act is judged by the motives that prompt it. Only that which is in accord with the principles of God's law will stand in the judgment. God is love. He has shown that love in the gift of Christ. When he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, he withheld nothing from his purchased possession. He gave all heaven, from which we may draw strength and efficiency, that we be not repulsed or overcome by our great adversary. But the love of God does not lead him to excuse sin. He did not excuse it in Satan. He did not excuse it in Adam or in Cain, nor will he excuse it in any other of the children of men. He will not connive at our sins or overlook our defects of character. He expects us to overcome in his name. Those who reject the gift of Christ's righteousness are rejecting the attributes of character which would constitute them the sons and daughters of God. They are rejecting that which alone could give them a fitness for a place at the marriage feast. In the parable, when the king inquired, How camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? The man was speechless. So it will be in the great judgment day. Men may now excuse their defects of character, but in that day they will offer no excuse. The professed churches of Christ in this generation are exalted to the highest privileges. The Lord has been revealed to us in ever-increasing light. Our privileges are far greater than were the privileges of God's ancient people. We have not only the great light committed to Israel, but we have the increased evidence of the great salvation brought to us through Christ. That which was type and symbol to the Jews is reality to us. They had the Old Testament history. We have that and the New Testament also. We have the assurance of a Savior who has come, a Savior who has been crucified, who has risen, and over the rent sepulchre of Joseph has proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. In our knowledge of Christ and his love, the kingdom of God is placed in the midst of us. Christ is revealed to us in sermons and chanted to us in songs. The spiritual banquet is set before us in rich abundance. The wedding garment, provided at infinite cost, is freely offered to every soul. By the messengers of God are presented to us the righteousness of Christ, justification by faith, the exceeding great and precious promise of God's word, free access to the Father by Christ, the comfort of the Spirit, the well-grounded assurance of eternal life in the kingdom of God. What could God do for us that he has not done in providing the great supper, the heavenly banquet? In heaven, it is said by the ministering angels, the ministry which we have been commissioned to perform we have done. We pressed back the army of evil agents. We sent brightness and light into the souls of men, quickening their memory for the love of God expressed in Jesus. We attracted their eyes to the cross of Christ. Their hearts were deeply moved by a sense of the sin that crucified the Son of God. They were convicted. They saw the steps to be taken in conversion. They felt the power of the gospel. Their hearts were made tender as they saw the sweetness of the love of God. They beheld the beauty of the character of Christ. But with the many it was all in vain. They would not surrender their own habits and character. They would not put off the garments of earth in order to be clothed with the robe of heaven. Their hearts were given to covetousness. They loved the associations of the world more than they loved their God. Solemn will be the day of final decision. In prophetic vision, the Apostle John describes it. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Sad will be the retrospect in that day, when men stand face to face with eternity. The whole life will present itself just as it has been. The world's pleasures, riches, and honors will not then seem so important. Men will then see that the righteousness they despise is alone of value. They will see that they have fashioned their characters under the deceptive allurements of Satan. The garments they have chosen are the badge of their allegiance to the first great apostate. Then they will see the results of their choice. They will have a knowledge of what it means to transgress the commandments of God. 
there will be no future probation in which to prepare for eternity. It is in this life that we are to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. This is our only opportunity to form characters for the home which Christ has made ready for those who obey his commandments. The days of our probation are fast closing. The end is near. To us the warning is given, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Beware, lest it find you unready. Take heed, lest you be found at the king's feast without a wedding garment. In such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. End of chapter 24「twenty five of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 25. Talents. Part 1. Christ, on the Mount of Olives, had spoken to his disciples of his second advent to the world. He had specified certain signs that were to show when his coming was near, and had bidden his disciples watch and be ready. Again he repeated the warning, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Then he showed what it means to watch for his coming. The time is to be spent not in idle waiting, but in diligent working. This lesson he taught in the parable of the talents. The kingdom of heaven, he said, is as a man travelling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. The man, travelling into a far country, represents Christ, who when speaking this parable was soon to depart from this earth to heaven. The bond servants or slaves of the parable, represent the followers of Christ. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price, not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. They that which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. All men have been bought with this infinite price, by pouring the whole treasury of heaven into this world, by giving us in Christ all heaven, God has purchased the will, the affections, the mind, the soul of every human being, whether believers or unbelievers, all men are the Lord's property. All are called to do service for him, and for the manner in which they have met this claim, all will be required to render an account at the great judgment day. But the claims of God are not recognized by all. It is those who profess to have accepted Christ's service, who in the parable are represented as his own servants. Christ's followers have been redeemed for service. Our Lord teaches that the true object of life is ministry. Christ himself was a worker, and to all his followers he gives the law of service, service to God and to their fellow men. Here, Christ has presented to the world a higher conception of life than they had ever known. By living to minister for others, man is brought into connection with Christ. The law of service becomes the connecting link which binds us to God and to our fellow men. To his servants, Christ commits his goods, something to be put to use for him. He gives to every man his work. Each has his place in the eternal plan of heaven. Each is to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is the special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. Gifts of the Holy Spirit The talents that Christ entrusts to his church represent especially the gifts and blessings imparted by the Holy Spirit. To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. All men do not receive the same gifts, 
but to every servant of the master some gift of the spirit is promised before he left his disciples christ breathed on them and saith unto them receive ye the holy ghost again he said behold i send the promise of my father upon you but not until after the ascension was the gift received in its fullness not until through faith and prayer the disciples had surrendered themselves fully for his working was the outpouring of the spirit received then in a special sense the goods of heaven were committed to the followers of christ when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of christ the spirit dividing to every man severally as he will the gifts are already ours in christ but their actual possession depends upon our reception of the spirit of god the promise of the spirit is not appreciated as it should be its fulfillment is not realized as it might be it is the absence of the spirit that makes the gospel ministry so powerless learning talents eloquence every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed but without the presence of the spirit of god no heart will be touched no sinner won to christ on the other hand if they are connected with christ if the gifts of the spirit are theirs the poorest and most ignorant of his disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts god makes them the channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe other talents the special gifts of the spirit are not the only talents represented in the parable it includes all gifts and endowments whether original or acquired natural or spiritual all are to be employed in christ's service in becoming his disciples we surrender ourselves to him with all that we are and have these gifts he returns to us purified and ennobled to be used for his glory in blessing our fellow men to every man god has given according to his several ability the talents are not apportioned capriciously he who has ability to use five talents receives five he who can improve but two receives two he who can wisely use only one receives one none need lament that they have not received larger gifts for he who has a portion to every man is equally honoured by the improvement of each trust whether it be great or small the one to whom five talents have been committed is to render the improvement of five he who has but one the improvement of one god expects returns according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not use of talents in the parable he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents and likewise he that had received two he also gained other two the talents however few are to be put to use the question that most concerns us is not how much have i received but what am i doing with that which i have the development of all our powers is the first duty we owe to god and to our fellow men no one who is not growing daily in capability and usefulness is fulfilling the purpose of life in making a profession of faith in christ we pledge ourselves to become all that it is possible for us to be as workers for the master and we should cultivate every faculty to the highest degree of perfection that we may do the greatest amount of good of which we are capable the lord has a great work to be done and he will bequeath the most in the future life to those who do the most faithful willing service in the present life the lord chooses his own agents and each day under different circumstances he gives them a trial of his plan of operation in each true-hearted endeavor to work out his plan he chooses his agents not because they are perfect but because through a connection with him they may gain perfection god will accept only those who are determined to aim high he places every human agent under obligation to do his best moral perfection is required of all never should we lower the standard of righteousness in order to accommodate inherited or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing we need to understand that imperfection of character is sin all righteous attributes of character dwell in god as a perfect harmonious whole and every one who receives christ as a personal savior is privileged to possess these attributes and those who would be workers together with god must strive for perfection in every organ of the body and quality of the mind true education is the preparation of the physical mental and moral powers for the performance of every duty it is the training of body mind and soul for divine service 
this is the education that will endure unto eternal life of every christian the lord requires growth in efficiency and capability in every line christ has paid us our wages even his own blood and suffering to secure our willing service he came to our world to give us an example of how we should work and what spirit we should bring into our labor he desires us to study how we can best advance his work and glorify his name in the world crowning with honor with the greatest love and devotion the father who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life but christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter a noble all-round character is not inherited it does not come to us by accident a noble character is earned by individual effort through the merits and grace of christ god gives the talents the powers of the mind we form the character it is formed by hard stern battles with self conflict after conflict must be waged against hereditary tendencies we shall have to criticize ourselves closely and allow not one unfavorable trait to remain uncorrected let no one say i cannot remedy my defects of character if you come to this decision you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life the impossibility lies in your own will if you will not then you cannot overcome the real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of god many whom god has qualified to do excellent work accomplish very little because they attempt little thousands pass through life as if they had no definite object for which to live no standard to reach such will obtain a reward proportionate to their works remember that you will never reach a higher standard than you yourself set then set your mark high and step by step even though it be by painful effort by self-denial and sacrifice ascend the whole length of the ladder of progress let nothing hinder you fate has not woven its meshes about any human being so firmly that he need remain helpless and in uncertainty opposing circumstances should create a firm determination to overcome them the breaking down of one barrier will give greater ability and courage to go forward press with determination in the right direction and circumstances will be your helpers not your hindrances be ambitious for the master's glory to cultivate every grace of character in every phase of your character building you are to please god this you may do for enoch pleased him though living in a degenerate age and there are enochs in this our day stand like daniel that faithful statesman a man whom no temptation could corrupt do not disappoint him who so loved you that he gave his own life to cancel your sins he says without me ye can do nothing remember this if you have made mistakes you certainly gain a victory if you see these mistakes and regard them as beacons of warning thus you turn defeat into victory disappointing the enemy and honoring your redeemer a character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure we can take from this world to the next those who are under the instruction of christ in this world will take every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansions and in heaven we are continually to improve how important then is the development of character in this life the heavenly intelligences will work with the human agent who seeks with determined faith that perfection of character which will reach out to perfection in action to everyone engaged in this work christ says i am at your right hand to help you as the will of man cooperates with the will of god it becomes omnipotent whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength all his biddings are enablings mental faculties god requires the training of the mental faculties he designs that his servant shall possess more intelligence and clearer discernment than the worldling and he is displeased with those who are too careless or too indolent to become efficient well-informed workers the lord bids us love him with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the strength and with all the mind this lays upon us the obligation of developing the intellect to its fullest capacity that with all the mind we may know and love our creator if placed under the control of his spirit the more thoroughly the intellect is cultivated the more effectively it can be used in the service of god the uneducated man who is consecrated to god and who longs to bless others can be and is used by the lord in his service 
but those who with the same spirit of consecration have had the benefit of a thorough education can do much more extensive work for christ they stand on vantage ground the lord desires us to obtain all the education possible with the object in view of imparting our knowledge to others none can know where or how they may be called to labor or to speak for god our heavenly father alone sees what he can make of men there are before us possibilities which our feeble faith does not discern our mind should be so trained that if necessary we can present the truths of his word before the highest earthly authorities in such a way as to glorify his name we should not let slip even one opportunity of qualifying ourselves intellectually to work for god let the youth who need an education set to work with determination to obtain it do not wait for an opening make one for yourselves take hold in any small way that presents itself practice economy do not spend your means for the gratification of appetite or in pleasure-seeking be determined to become as useful and efficient as god calls you to be be thorough and faithful in whatever you undertake procure every advantage within your reach for strengthening the intellect let the study of books be combined with useful manual labor and by faithful endeavor watchfulness and prayer secure the wisdom that is from above this will give you an all-round education thus you may rise in character and gain an influence over other minds enabling you to lead them in the path of uprightness and holiness far more might be accomplished in the work of self-education if we were awake to our own opportunities and privileges true education means more than the colleges can give while the study of the sciences is not to be neglected there is a higher training to be obtained through a vital connection with god let every student take his bible and place himself in communion with the great teacher let the mind be trained and disciplined to wrestle with hard problems in the search for divine truth those who hunger for knowledge that they may bless their fellow men will themselves receive blessing from god through a study of his word their mental powers will be aroused to earnest activity there will be an expansion and development of the faculties and the mind will acquire power and efficiency self-discipline must be practiced by everyone who would be a worker for god this will accomplish more than eloquence or the most brilliant talents an ordinary mind well disciplined will accomplish more and higher work than will the most highly educated mind and the greatest talents without self-control speech the power of speech is a talent that should be diligently cultivated of all the gifts we have received from god none is capable of being a greater blessing than this with the voice we convince and persuade with it we offer prayer and praise to god and with it we tell others of the redeemer's love how important then that it be so trained as to be most effective for good the culture and right use of the voice are greatly neglected even by persons of intelligence and christian activity there are many who read or speak in so low or so rapid a manner that they cannot be readily understood some have a thick indistinct utterance others speak in a high key in sharp shrill tones that are painful to the hearers texts hymns and the reports and other papers presented before public assemblies are sometimes read in such a way that they are not understood and often so that their force and impressiveness are destroyed this is an evil that can and should be corrected on this point the bible gives instruction of the levites who read the scriptures to the people in the days of ezra it is said they read in the book in the law of god distinctly they gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading by diligent effort all may acquire the power to read intelligibly and to speak in a full clear round tone in a distinct and impressive manner by doing this we may greatly increase our efficiency as workers for christ every christian is called to make known to others the unsearchable riches of christ therefore he should seek for perfection in speech he should present the word of god in a way that will commend it to the hearers god does not design that his human channel shall be uncouth it is not his will that man shall belittle or degrade the heavenly current that flows through him to the world we should look to jesus the perfect pattern we should pray for the aid of the holy spirit and in his strength we should seek to train every organ for perfect work especially is this true of those who are called to public service every minister and every teacher should bear in mind that he is giving to the people a message that involves eternal interests the truth spoken will judge them in the great day of final reckoning 
and with some souls the manner of the one delivering the message will determine its reception or rejection then let the word be so spoken that it will appeal to the understanding and impress the heart slowly distinctly and solemnly should it be spoken yet with all the earnestness which its importance demands the right culture and use of the power of speech has to do with every line of christian work it enters into the home life and into all our intercourse with one another we should accustom ourselves to speak in pleasant tones to use pure and correct language and words that are kind and courteous sweet kind words are as dew and gentle showers to the soul the scripture says of christ that grace was poured into his lips that he might know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary and the lord bids us let your speech be alway with grace that it may minister grace unto the hearers in seeking to correct or reform others we should be careful of our words they will be a savour of life unto life or of death unto death in giving reproof or counsel many indulge in sharp severe speech words not adapted to heal the wounded soul by these ill-advised expressions the spirit is chafed and often the erring ones are stirred to rebellion all who would advocate the principles of truth need to receive the heavenly oil of love under all circumstances reproof should be spoken in love then our words will reform but not exasperate christ by his holy spirit will supply the force and the power this is his work not one word is to be spoken unadvisedly no evil speaking no frivolous talk no fretful repining or impure suggestion will escape the lips of him who is following christ the apostle paul writing by the holy spirit says let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth a corrupt communication does not mean only words that are vile it means any expression contrary to holy principles and pure and undefiled religion it includes impure hints and covert insinuations of evil unless instantly resisted these lead to great sin upon every family upon every individual christian is laid the duty of barring the way against corrupt speech when in the company of those who indulge in foolish talk it is our duty to change the subject of conversation if possible by the help of the grace of god we should quietly drop words or introduce a subject that will turn the conversation into a profitable channel it is the work of parents to train their children to proper habits of speech the very best school for this culture is the home life from the earliest years the children should be taught to speak respectfully and lovingly to their parents and to one another they should be taught that only words of gentleness truth and purity must pass their lips let the parents themselves be daily learners in the school of christ then by precept and example they can teach their children the use of sound speech that cannot be condemned this is one of the greatest and most responsible of their duties as followers of christ we should make our words such as to be a help and an encouragement to one another in the christian life far more than we do we need to speak of the precious chapters of our experience we should speak of the mercy and loving kindness of god of the matchless depths of the saviour's love our words should be words of praise and thanksgiving if the mind and heart are full of the love of god this will be revealed in the conversation it will not be a difficult matter to impart that which enters into our spiritual life great thoughts noble aspirations clear perceptions of truth unselfish purposes yearnings for piety and holiness will bear fruit in words that reveal the character of the heart treasure when christ is thus revealed in our speech it will have power in winning souls to him we should speak of christ to those who know him not we should do as christ did wherever he was in the synagogue by the wayside in the boat thrust out a little from the land at the pharisees feast or at the table of the publican he spoke to men of the things pertaining to the higher life the things of nature the events of daily life were bound up by him with the words of truth the hearts of his hearers were drawn to him for he had healed their sick had comforted their sorrowing ones and had taken their children in his arms and blessed them when he opened his lips to speak their attention was riveted upon him and every word was to some soul a savour of life unto life so it should be with us wherever we are we should watch for opportunities of speaking to others of the saviour if we follow christ's example in doing good hearts will open to us as they did to him not abruptly but with tact born of divine love we can tell them of him who is the chiefest among ten thousand and the one altogether lovely 
this is the very highest work in which we can employ the talent of speech it was given to us that we might present christ as the sin pardoning saviour influence the life of christ was an ever widening shoreless influence an influence that bound him to god and to the whole human family through christ god has invested man with an influence that makes it impossible for him to live to himself individually we are connected with our fellow men a part of god's great whole and we stand under mutual obligations no man can be independent of his fellow men for the well-being of each affects others it is god's purpose that each shall feel himself necessary to others welfare and seek to promote their happiness every soul is surrounded by an atmosphere of its own an atmosphere it may be charged with the life-giving power of faith courage and hope and sweet with the fragrance of love or it may be heavy and chill with the gloom of discontent and selfishness or poisonous with the deadly taint of cherished sin by the atmosphere surrounding us every person with whom we come in contact is consciously or unconsciously affected this is a responsibility from which we cannot free ourselves our words our acts our dress our deportment even the expression of the countenance has an influence upon the impression thus made there hang results for good or evil which no man can measure every impulse thus imparted is seed sown which will produce its harvest it is a link in the long chain of human events extending we know not whither if by our example we aid others in the development of good principles we give them power to do good in their turn they exert the same influence upon others and they upon still others thus by our unconscious influence thousands may be blessed throw a pebble into the lake and a wave is formed and another and another and as they increase the circle widens until it reaches the very shore so with our influence beyond our knowledge or control it tells upon others in blessing or in cursing character is power the silent witness of a true unselfish godly life carries an almost irresistible influence by revealing in our own life the character of christ we cooperate with him in the work of saving souls it is only by revealing in our life his character that we can cooperate with him and the wider the sphere of our influence the more good we may do when those who profess to serve god follow christ's example practicing the principles of the law in their daily life when every act bears witness that they love god supremely and their neighbor as themselves then will the church have power to move the world but it should never be forgotten that influence is no less a power for evil to lose one's own soul is a terrible thing but to cause the loss of other souls is still more terrible that our influence should be a savour of death unto death is a fearful thought yet this is possible many who profess to gather with christ are scattering from him this is why the church is so weak many indulge freely in criticism and accusing by giving expression to suspicion jealousy and discontent they yield themselves as instruments to satan before they realize what they are doing the adversary has through them accomplished his purpose the impression of evil has been made the shadow has been cast the arrows of satan have found their mark distrust unbelief and downright infidelity have fastened upon those who otherwise might have accepted christ meanwhile the workers for satan look complacently upon those whom they have driven to scepticism and who are now hardened against reproof and entreaty they flatter themselves that in comparison with these souls they are virtuous and righteous they do not realize that these sad wrecks of character are the work of their own unbridled tongues and rebellious hearts it is through their influence that these tempted ones have fallen so frivolity selfish indulgence and careless indifference on the part of professed christians are turning away many souls from the path of life many there are who will fear to meet at the bar of god the results of their influence it is only through the grace of god that we can make a right use of this endowment there is nothing in us of ourselves by which we can influence others for good if we realize our helplessness and our need of divine power we shall not trust to ourselves we know not what results a day an hour or a moment may determine and never should we begin the day without committing our ways to our heavenly father his angels are appointed to watch over us and if we put ourselves under their guardianship then in every time of danger they will be at our right hand 
when unconsciously we are in danger of exerting a wrong influence the angels will be by our side prompting us to a better course choosing our words for us and influencing our actions thus our influence may be a silent unconscious but mighty power in drawing others to christ and the heavenly world time our time belongs to god every moment is his and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to his glory of no talent he has given will he require a more strict account than of our time the value of time is beyond computation christ regarded every moment as precious and it is thus that we should regard it life is too short to be trifled away we have but a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity we have no time to waste no time to devote to selfish pleasure no time for the indulgence of sin it is now that we are to form characters for the future immortal life it is now that we are to prepare for the searching judgment the human family have scarcely begun to live when they begin to die and the world's incessant labour ends in nothingness unless a true knowledge in regard to eternal life is gained the man who appreciates time as his working day will fit himself for a mansion and for a life that is immortal it is well that he was born we are admonished to redeem the time but time squandered can never be recovered we cannot call back even one moment the only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of that which remains by being co-workers with god in his great plan of redemption in him who does this a transformation of character takes place he becomes a son of god a member of the royal family a child of the heavenly king he is fitted to be the companion of the angels now is our time to labor for the salvation of our fellow men there are some who think that if they give money to the cause of christ this is all they are required to do the precious time in which they might do personal service for him passes unimproved but it is the privilege and duty of all who have health and strength to render to god active service all are to labor in winning souls to christ donations of money cannot take the place of this every moment is freighted with eternal consequences we are to stand as minute men ready for service at a moment's notice the opportunity that is now ours to speak to some needy soul the word of life may never offer again god may say to that one this night thy soul shall be required of thee and through our neglect he may not be ready in the great judgment day how shall we render our account to god life is too solemn to be absorbed in temporal and earthly matters in a treadmill of care and anxiety for the things that are but an atom in comparison with the things of eternal interest yet god has called us to serve him in the temporal affairs of life diligence in this work is as much a part of true religion as is devotion the bible gives no endorsement to idleness it is the greatest curse that afflicts our world every man and woman who is truly converted will be a diligent worker upon the right improvement of our time depends our success in acquiring knowledge and mental culture the cultivation of the intellect need not be prevented by poverty humble origin or unfavorable surroundings only let the moments be treasured a few moments here and a few there that might be frittered away in aimless talk the morning hours so often wasted in bed the time spent in traveling on trams or railway cars or waiting at the station the moments of waiting for meals waiting for those who are tardy and keeping an appointment if a book were kept at hand and these fragments of time were improved in study reading or in careful thought what might not be accomplished a resolute purpose persistent industry and careful economy of time will enable men to acquire knowledge and mental discipline which will qualify them for almost any position of influence and usefulness it is the duty of every christian to acquire habits of order thoroughness and dispatch there is no excuse for slow bungling at work of any character when one is always at work and the work is never done it is because mind and heart are not put into the labor the one who is slow and who works at a disadvantage should realize that these are faults to be corrected he needs to exercise his mind in planning how to use the time so as to secure the best results by tact and method some will accomplish as much work in five hours as another does in ten some who are engaged in domestic labor are always at work not because they have so much to do but because they do not plan so as to save time by their slow dilatory ways they make much work out of very little but all who will may overcome these fussy lingering habits in their work let them have a definite aim 
decide how long a time is required for a given task, and then bend every effort towards accomplishing the work in the given time. The exercise of the will power will make the hands move deftly. Through lack of determination to take themselves in hand and reform, persons can become stereotyped in a wrong course of action, and by cultivating their powers they may acquire ability to do the very best of service. Then they will find themselves in demand anywhere and everywhere. They will be appreciated for all that they are worth. By many children and youth, time is wasted that might be spent in carrying home burdens, and thus showing a loving interest in father and mother the youth might take upon their strong young shoulders many responsibilities which some one must bear the life of christ from his earliest years was a life of earnest activity he lived not to please himself he was the son of the infinite god yet he worked at the carpenter's trade with his father joseph his trade was significant he had come into the world as the character builder and as such all his work was perfect into all his secular labour he brought the same perfection as into the characters he was transforming by his divine power he is our pattern parents should teach their children the value and right use of time teach them that to do something which will honour god and bless humanity is worth striving for even in their early years they can be missionaries for god parents cannot commit a greater sin than by allowing their children to have nothing to do the children soon learn to love idleness, and they grow up shiftless, useless men and women. When they are old enough to earn their living and find employment, they work in a lazy, droning way, yet expect to be paid as much as if they were faithful. There is a worldwide difference between this class of workers and those who realize that they must be faithful stewards. Indolent, careless habits indulged in secular work will be brought into the religious life and will unfit one to do any efficient service for God many who through diligent labor might have been a blessing to the world have been ruined through idleness lack of employment and of steadfast purpose opens the door to a thousand temptations evil companions and vicious habits deprave mind and soul and the result is ruin for this life and for the life to come whatever the line of work in which we engage the word of god teaches us to be not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the lord Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. End of Talents, Part 1For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Talents, Part 2. Health. Health is a blessing of which few appreciate the value. Yet upon it, the efficiency of our mental and physical powers largely depends. Our impulses and passions have their seat in the body, and it must be kept in the best condition physically and under the most spiritual influences in order that our talents may be put to the highest use anything that lessens physical strength enfeebles the mind and makes it less capable of discriminating between right and wrong we become less capable of choosing the good and have less strength of will to do that which we know to be right the misuse of our physical powers shortens the period of time in which our lives can be used for the glory of god and it unfits us to accomplish the work god has given us to do by allowing ourselves to form wrong habits by keeping late hours by gratifying appetite at the expense of health we lay the foundation for feebleness by neglecting physical exercise by overworking mind or body we unbalance the nervous system those who thus shorten their lives and unfit themselves for service by disregarding nature's laws are guilty of robbery towards god and they are robbing their fellow men also the opportunity of blessing others, the very work for which God sent them into the world, has by their own course of action been cut short. And they have unfitted themselves to do even that which in a briefer period of time they might have accomplished. The Lord holds us guilty when by our injurious habits we thus deprive the world of good. Transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law, for God is as truly the author of physical laws as he is the author of the moral law. His law is written with his own finger upon every nerve, every muscle, every faculty which has been entrusted to man. 
and every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. All should have an intelligent knowledge of the human frame that they may keep their bodies in the condition necessary to do the work of the Lord. The physical life is to be carefully preserved and developed, that through humanity the divine nature may be revealed in its fullness. The relation of the physical organism to the spiritual life is one of the most important branches of education. It should receive careful attention in the home and in the school. All need to become acquainted with their physical structure and the laws that control natural life. He who remains in willing ignorance of the laws of his physical being, and who violates them through ignorance, is sinning against God. All should place themselves in the best possible relation to life and health. Our habits should be brought under the control of a mind that is itself under the control of God. Know ye not, says the Apostle Paul, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Strength. We are to love God, not only with all the heart, mind, and soul, but with all the strength. This covers the full intelligent use of the physical powers. Christ was a true worker in temporal as well as in spiritual things, and into all his work he brought a determination to do his Father's will. The things of heaven and earth are more closely connected and are more directly under the supervision of Christ than many realize. It was Christ who planned the arrangement for the first earthly tabernacle. He gave every specification in regard to the building of Solomon's temple. The one who in his earthly life worked as a carpenter in the village of Nazareth was the heavenly architect who marked out the plan for the sacred building where his name was to be honored. It was Christ who gave to the builders of the tabernacle wisdom to execute the most skillful and beautiful workmanship. He said, See, I have called by name Bezaleel the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. God desires that his workers in every line shall look to him as the giver of all they possess. All right inventions and improvements have their source in him, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. The skilful touch of the physician's hand, his power over nerve and muscle, his knowledge of the delicate organism of the body, is the wisdom of divine power to be used in behalf of the suffering. The skill with which the carpenter uses the hammer, the strength with which the blacksmith makes the anvil ring, comes from God. He has entrusted men with talents, and he expects them to look to him for counsel. Whatever we do, in whatever department of the work we are placed, he desires to control our minds, that we may do perfect work. Religion and business are not two separate things. They are one. Bible religion is to be interwoven with all we do or say. Divine and human agencies are to combine in temporal as well as in spiritual achievements. They are to be united in all human pursuits, in mechanical and agricultural labours, in mercantile and scientific enterprises. There must be cooperation in everything embraced in Christian activity. God has proclaimed the principles on which alone this cooperation is possible. His glory must be the motive of all who are labourers together with Him. All our work is to be done from love to God and in accordance with His will. It is just as essential to do the will of God when erecting a building as when taking part in a religious service. And if the workers have brought the right principles into their own character-making, then in the erection of every building they will grow in grace and knowledge. But God will not accept the greatest talents or the most splendid service unless self is laid upon the altar, a living, consuming sacrifice. The root must be holy, else there can be no fruit acceptable to God. The Lord made Daniel and Joseph shrewd managers. He could work through them because they did not live to please their own inclination, but to please God. The case of Daniel has a lesson for us. It reveals the fact that a businessman is not necessarily a sharp policy man. He can be instructed by God at every step. Daniel, while Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Babylon, was a prophet of God, receiving the light of heavenly inspiration. Worldly, ambitious statesmen are represented in the word of God as the grass that groweth up, and as the flower of the grass that fadeth. Yet the Lord desires to have in his service intelligent men, men qualified for various lines of work. 
there is need of businessmen who will weave the grand principles of truth into all their transactions and their talent should be perfected by most thorough study and training if men in any line of work need to improve their opportunities to become wise and efficient it is those who are using their ability in building up the kingdom of god in our world of daniel we learn that in all his business transactions when subjected to the closest scrutiny not one fault or error could be found he was a sample of what every businessman may be his history shows what may be accomplished by one who consecrates the strength of brain and bone and muscle of heart and life to the service of god money god also entrusts men with means he gives them power to get wealth he waters the earth with the dews of heaven and with the showers of refreshing rain he gives the sunlight which warms the earth awakening to life the things of nature and causing them to flourish and bear fruit and he asks for a return of his own our money has not been given us that we might honor and glorify ourselves as faithful stewards we are to use it for the glory and honor of god some think that only a portion of their means is the lord's when they have set apart a portion for religious and charitable purposes they regard the remainder as their own to be used as they see fit but in this they mistake all we possess is the lord's and we are accountable to him for the use we make of it in the use of every penny it will be seen whether we love god supremely and our neighbor as ourselves money has great value because it can do great good in the hands of god's children it is food for the hungry drink for the thirsty and clothing for the naked it is a defense for the oppressed and a means to help the sick but money is of no more value than sand only as it is put to use in providing for the necessities of life in blessing others and in advancing the cause of christ hoarded wealth is not merely useless it is a curse in this life it is a snare to the soul drawing the affections away from the heavenly treasure in the great day of god its witness to unused talents and neglected opportunities will condemn its possessor the scripture says go to now ye rich men weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire ye have heaped treasure together for the last days behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud crieth and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the lord of sabaoth but christ sanctions no lavish or careless use of means his lesson in economy gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost is for all his followers he who realizes that his money is a talent from god will use it economically and will feel it a duty to save that he may give the more means we expend in display and self-indulgence the less we can have to feed the hungry and clothe the naked every penny used unnecessarily deprives the spender of a precious opportunity of doing good it is robbing god of the honor and glory which should flow back to him through the improvement of his entrusted talents kindly impulses and affections kindly affections generous impulses and a quick apprehension of spiritual things are precious talents and lay their possessor under a weighty responsibility all are to be used in god's service but here many err satisfied with the possession of these qualities they fail to bring them into active service for others they flatter themselves that if they had the opportunity if circumstances were favorable they would do a great and good work but they are awaiting the opportunity they despise the narrowness of the poor niggard who grudges even a pittance to the needy they see that he is living for self and that he is responsible for his misused talents with much complacency they draw the contrast between themselves and such narrow-minded ones feeling that their own condition is much more favorable than that of their mean-souled neighbors but they are deceiving themselves the mere possession of unused qualities only increases their responsibility those who possess large affections are under obligation to god to bestow them not merely on their friends but on all who need their help social advantages are talents and are to be used for the benefit of all within reach of our influence the love that gives kindness to only a few is not love but selfishness it will not in any way work for the good of souls or the glory of god those who thus leave their master's talents unimproved are even more guilty than other ones for whom they feel such contempt to them it will be said ye knew your master's will but did it not 
talents multiplied by use talents used are talents multiplied success is not the result of chance or of destiny it is the outworking of god's own providence the reward of faith and discretion of virtue and persevering effort the lord desires us to use every gift we have and if we do this we shall have greater gifts to use he does not supernaturally endow us with the qualifications we lack but while we use that which we have he will work with us to increase and strengthen every faculty by every whole-hearted earnest sacrifice for the master's service our powers will increase while we yield ourselves as instruments for the holy spirit's working the grace of god works in us to deny old inclinations to overcome powerful propensities and to form new habits as we cherish and obey the promptings of the spirit our hearts are enlarged to receive more and more of his power and to do more and better work dormant energies are aroused and palsied faculties receive new life the humble worker who obediently responds to the call of god may be sure of receiving divine assistance to accept so great and holy a responsibility is itself elevating to the character it calls into action the highest mental and spiritual powers and strengthens and purifies the mind and heart through faith in the power of god it is wonderful how strong a weak man may become how decided his efforts how prolific of great results he who begins with a little knowledge in a humble way and tells what he knows while seeking diligently for further knowledge will find the whole heavenly treasure awaiting his demand the more he seeks to impart light the more light he will receive the more one tries to explain the word of god to others with a love for souls the plainer it becomes to himself the more we use our knowledge and exercise our powers the more knowledge and power we shall have every effort made for christ will react in blessing upon ourselves if we use our means for his glory he will give us more as we seek to win others to christ bearing the burden of souls in our prayers our own hearts will throb with the quickening influence of god's grace our own affections will glow with more divine fervor our whole christian life will be more of a reality more earnest more prayerful the value of man is estimated in heaven according to the capacity of the heart to know god this knowledge is the spring from which flows all power god created man that every faculty might be the faculty of the divine mind he is ever seeking to bring the human mind into association with the divine he offers us the privilege of cooperation with christ in revealing his grace to the world that we may receive increased knowledge of heavenly things looking unto jesus we obtain brighter and more distinct views of god and by beholding we become changed goodness love for our fellow men becomes our natural instinct we develop a character which is the counterpart of the divine character growing into his likeness we enlarge our capacity for knowing god more and more we enter into fellowship with the heavenly world and we have continually increasing power to receive the riches of the knowledge and wisdom of eternity the one talent the man who received the one talent went and digged in the earth and hid his lord's money it was the one with the smallest gift who left his talent unimproved in this is given a warning to all who feel that the smallness of their endowments excuses them from service for christ if they could do some great thing how gladly would they undertake it but because they can serve only in little things they think themselves justified in doing nothing in this they err the lord in his distribution of gifts is testing character the man who neglected to improve his talent proved himself an unfaithful servant had he received five talents he would have buried them as he buried the one his misuse of the one talent showed that he despised the gifts of heaven he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much the importance of the little things is often underrated because they are small but they supply much of the actual discipline of life there are really no non-essentials in the christian's life our character building will be full of peril while we underrate the importance of the little things he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much by unfaithfulness in even the smallest duties man robs his maker of the service which is his due this unfaithfulness reacts upon himself he fails of gaining the grace the power the force of character which may be received through an unreserved surrender to god living apart from christ he is subject to satan's temptations and he makes mistakes in his work for the master 
because he is not guided by right principles in little things he fails to obey god in the great matters which he regards as his special work the defects cherished in dealing with life's minor details pass into more important affairs he acts on the principles to which he has accustomed himself thus actions repeated form habits habits form character and by the character our destiny for time and for eternity is decided only by faithfulness in the little things can the soul be trained to act with fidelity under larger responsibilities god brought daniel and his fellows into connection with the great men of babylon that these heathen men might become acquainted with the principles of true religion in the midst of a nation of idolaters daniel was to represent the character of god how did he become fitted for a position of so great trust and honor it was his faithfulness in the little things that gave complexion to his whole life he honored god in the smallest duties and the lord cooperated with him to daniel and his companions god gave knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom and daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams as god called daniel to witness for him in babylon so he calls us to be his witnesses in the world today in the smallest as well as the largest affairs of life he desires us to reveal to men the principles of his kingdom christ in his life on earth taught the lesson of careful attention to the little things the great work of redemption weighed continually upon his soul as he was teaching and healing all the energies of mind and body were taxed to the utmost yet he noticed the most simple things in life and in nature his most instructive lessons were those in which by the simple things of nature he illustrated the great truths of the kingdom of god he did not overlook the necessities of the humblest of his servants his ear heard every cry of need he was awake to the touch of the afflicted woman in the crowd the very slightest touch of faith brought a response when he raised from the dead the daughter of jairus he reminded her parents that she must have something to eat when by his own mighty power he rose from the tomb he did not disdain to fold and put carefully in the proper place the grave clothes in which he had been laid away the work to which as christians we are called is to cooperate with christ for the salvation of souls this work we have entered into covenant with him to do to neglect the work is to prove disloyal to christ but in order to accomplish this work we must follow his example of faithful conscientious attention to the little things this is the secret of success in every line of christian effort and influence the lord desires his people to reach the highest round of the ladder that they may glorify him by possessing the ability he is willing to bestow through the grace of god every provision has been made for us to reveal that we act upon better plans than those upon which the world acts we are to show a superiority in intellect in understanding in skill and knowledge because we believe in god and in his power to work upon human hearts but those who have not a large endowment of gifts need not become discouraged let them use what they have faithfully guarding every weak point in their characters seeking by divine grace to make it strong into every action of life we are to weave faithfulness and loyalty cultivating the attributes that will enable us to accomplish the work habits of negligence should be resolutely overcome many think it is a sufficient excuse for the grossest errors to plead forgetfulness but do they not as well as others possess intellectual faculties then they should discipline their minds to be retentive it is a sin to forget a sin to be negligent if you form a habit of negligence you may neglect your own soul's salvation and at last find that you are unready for the kingdom of god great truths must be brought into little things practical religion is to be carried into the lowly duties of daily life the greatest qualification for any man is to obey implicitly the word of the lord because they are not connected with some directly religious work many feel that their lives are useless that they are doing nothing for the advancement of god's kingdom but this is a mistake if their work is that which someone must do they should not accuse themselves of uselessness in the great household of god the humblest duties are not to be ignored any honest work is a blessing and faithfulness in it may prove a training for higher trusts however lowly any work done for god with a full surrender of self is as acceptable to him as the highest service no offering is small that is given with true-heartedness and gladness of soul wherever we may be christ bids us to take up the duty that presents itself if this is in the home take hold willingly and earnestly to make home a pleasant place if you are a mother train your children for christ this is as verily a work for god as is that of the minister in the pulpit 
if your duty is in the kitchen seek to be a perfect cook prepare food that will be healthful nourishing and appetizing and as you employ the best ingredients in preparing food remember that you are to give your mind the best thoughts if it is your work to till the soil or to engage in any other trade or occupation make a success of the present duty put your mind on what you are doing in all your work represent christ do as he would do in your place however small your talent god has a place for it that one talent wisely used will accomplish its appointed work by faithfulness in little duties we are to work on the plan of addition and god will work for us on the plan of multiplication these littles will become the most precious influences in his work let a living faith run like threads of gold through the performance of even the smallest duties then all the daily work will promote christian growth there will be a continual looking unto jesus love for him will give vital force to everything that is undertaken thus through the right use of our talents we may link ourselves by a golden chain to the higher world this is true sanctification for sanctification consists in the cheerful performance of daily duties in perfect obedience to the will of god but many christians are waiting for some great work to be brought to them because they cannot find a place large enough to satisfy their ambition they fail to perform faithfully the common duties of life these seem to them uninteresting day by day they let slip opportunities for showing their faithfulness to god while they are waiting for some great work life passes away its purposes unfulfilled its work unaccomplished the talents returned after a long time the lord of these servants cometh and reckoneth with them when the lord takes account of his servants the return from every talent will be scrutinized the work done reveals the character of the worker those who have received the five and the two talents return to the lord the entrusted gifts with their increase in doing this they claim no merit for themselves their talents are those that have been delivered to them they have gained other talents but there could have been no gain without the deposit they see that they have done only their duty the capital was the lord's the improvement is his had not the saviour bestowed upon them his love and grace they would have been bankrupt for eternity but when the master receives the talents he approves and rewards the workers as though the merit were all their own his countenance is full of joy and satisfaction he is filled with delight that he can bestow blessings upon them for every service and every sacrifice he requites them not because it is a debt he owes but because his heart is overflowing with love and tenderness well done thou good and faithful servant he says thou hast been faithful over a few things i will make thee ruler over many things enter thou into the joy of thy lord it is the faithfulness the loyalty to god the loving service that wins divine approval every impulse of the holy spirit leading men to goodness and to god is noted in the books of heaven and in the day of god the workers through whom he has wrought will be commended they will enter into the joy of the lord as they see in his kingdom those who have been redeemed through their instrumentality and they are privileged to participate in his work there because they have gained a fitness for it by participation in his work here what we shall be in heaven is the reflection of what we are now in character and holy service christ said of himself the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister this his work on earth is his work in heaven and our reward for working with christ in this world is the greater power and wider privilege of working with him in the world to come then he which had received the one talent came and said lord i knew thee that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strewed and i was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth lo there thou hast that is thine thus men excuse their neglect of god's gifts they look upon god as severe and tyrannical as watching to spy out their mistakes and visit them with judgments they charge him with demanding what he has never given with reaping where he has not sown there are many who in their hearts charge god with being a hard master because he claims their possessions and their service but we can bring to god nothing that is not already his all things come of thee said king david and of thine own have we given thee all things are god's not only by creation but by redemption all the blessings of this life and of the life to come are delivered to us stamped with the cross of calvary therefore the charge that god is a hard master reaping where he has not sown is false the master does not deny the charge of the wicked servant unjust as it is but taking him on his own ground he shows that his conduct is without excuse 
ways and means had been provided whereby the talent might have been improved to the owner's profit thou oughtest he said to have put my money to the exchanges and then at my coming i should have received mine own with ursury our heavenly father requires no more nor less than he has given us ability to do he lays upon his servants no burdens that they are not able to bear he knoweth our frame he remembereth that we are dust all that he claims from us we through divine grace can render unto whomsoever much is given of him much shall be required we shall individually be held responsible for doing one jot less than we have ability to do the lord measures with exactness every possibility for service the unused capabilities are as much brought into account as are those that are improved for all that we might become through the right use of our talents god holds us responsible we shall be judged according to what we ought to have done but did not accomplish because we did not use our powers to glorify god even if we do not lose our souls we shall realize in eternity the result of our unused talents for all the knowledge and ability that we might have gained and did not there will be an eternal loss but when we give ourselves wholly to god and in our work follow his directions he makes himself responsible for its accomplishment he would not have us conjecture as to the success of our honest endeavours not once should we even think of failure we are to cooperate with one who knows no failure we should not talk of our own weakness and inability this is a manifest distrust of god a denial of his word when we murmur because of our burdens or refuse the responsibilities he calls upon us to bear we are virtually saying that he is a hard master that he requires what he has not given us power to do the spirit of the slothful servant we are often fain to call humility but true humility is widely different to be clothed with humility does not mean that we are to be dwarfs in intellect deficient in aspiration and cowardly in our lives shunning burdens lest we fail to carry them successfully real humility fulfills god's purposes by depending upon his strength god works by whom he will he sometimes selects the humblest instrument to do the greatest work for his power is revealed through the weakness of men we have our standard and by it we pronounce one thing great and another small but god does not estimate according to our rule we are not to suppose that what is great to us must be great to god or that what is small to us must be small to him it does not rest with us to pass judgment on our talents or to choose our work we are to take up the burdens that god appoints bearing them for his sake and ever going to him for rest whatever our work god is honored by whole-hearted cheerful service he is pleased when we take up our duties with gratitude rejoicing that we are accounted worthy to be co-laborers with him the talent removed upon the slothful servant the sentence was take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents here as in the reward of the faithful worker is indicated not merely the reward at the final judgment but the gradual process of retribution in this life as in the natural so in the spiritual world every power unused will weaken and decay activity is the law of life idleness is death the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit withal employed to bless others his gifts increase shut up to self-serving they diminish and are finally withdrawn he who refuses to impart that which he has received will at last find that he has nothing to give he is consenting to a process that surely dwarfs and finally destroys the faculties of the soul let none suppose that they can live a life of selfishness and then having served their own interests enter into the joy of their lord in the joy of unselfish love they could not participate they would not be fitted for the heavenly courts they could not appreciate the pure atmosphere of love that pervades heaven the voices of the angels and the music of their harps would not satisfy them to their minds the science of heaven would be as an enigma in the great judgment day those who have not worked for christ those who have drifted along carrying no responsibility thinking of themselves pleasing themselves will be judged by the judge of all the earth with those who did evil they will receive the same condemnation many who profess to be christians neglect the claims of god and yet they do not feel that in this there is any wrong they know that the blasphemer the murderer the adulterer deserves punishment but as for them they enjoy the services of religion they love to hear the gospel preached and therefore they think themselves christians though they have spent their lives in caring for themselves they will be as much surprised as was the unfaithful servant in the parable to hear the sentence take the talent from him 
like the jews they mistake the enjoyment of their blessings for the use they should make of them many who excuse themselves from christian effort plead their inability for the work but did god make them so incapable no never this inability has been produced by their own inactivity and perpetuated by their deliberate choice already in their own characters they are realizing the result of the sentence take the talent from him the continual misuse of their talents will effectually quench for them the holy spirit which is the only light the sentence cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness sets heaven's seal to the choice which they themselves have made for eternity End of Talents Part 2「Of Christ's Object Lessons」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 27 Friends by the Mammon of Unrighteousness. Christ's coming was at a time of intense worldliness. Men were subordinating the eternal to the temporal the claims of the future to the affairs of the present they were mistaking phantoms for realities and realities for phantoms they did not by faith behold the unseen world satan presented before them the things of this life as all attractive and all absorbing and they gave heed to his temptations christ came to change this order of things he sought to break the spell by which men were infatuated and ensnared in his teaching he sought to adjust the claims of heaven and earth to turn men's thoughts from the present to the future from their pursuit of the things of time he called them to make provision for eternity there was a certain rich man he said which had a steward and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods the rich man had left all his possessions in the hands of this servant but the servant was unfaithful and the master was convinced that he was being systematically robbed he determined to retain him no longer in his service and he called for an investigation of his accounts how is it he said that i hear this of thee give an account of thy stewardship for thou mayest be no longer steward with the prospect of discharge before him the steward saw three paths open to his choice he must labour beg or starve and he said within himself what shall i do for my lord taketh away from me the stewardship i cannot dig to beg i am ashamed i am resolved what to do that when i am put out of the stewardship they may receive me into their houses so he called every one of his lord's debtors unto him and he said unto the first how much owest thou unto my lord and he said an hundred measures of oil and he said unto him take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty then he said to another and how much owest thou and he said an hundred measures of wheat and he said unto him take thy bill and write fourscore this unfaithful servant made others sharers with him in his dishonesty he defrauded his master to advantage them and by accepting this advantage they placed themselves under obligation to receive him as a friend into their homes and the lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely the worldly man praised the sharpness of the man who had defrauded him but the rich man's commendation was not the commendation of god christ did not commend the unjust steward but he made use of a well-known occurrence to illustrate the lesson he desired to teach make to yourselves friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness he said that when it shall fail they may receive you into the eternal tabernacles the saviour had been censured by the pharisees for mingling with publicans and sinners but his interest in them was not lessened nor did his efforts for them cease he saw that their employment brought them into temptation they were surrounded by enticements to evil the first wrong step was easy and the descent was rapid to greater dishonesty and increased crimes christ was seeking by every means to win them to higher aims and nobler principles this purpose he had in mind in the story of the unfaithful steward there had been among the publicans just such a case as that represented in the parable and in christ's description they recognized their own practices their attention was arrested and from the picture of their own dishonest practices many of them learned a lesson of spiritual truth the parable was however spoken directly to the disciples to them first the leaven of truth was imparted and through them it was to reach others much of christ's teaching the disciples did not at first understand and often his lessons seemed to be almost forgotten 
but under the influence of the holy spirit these truths were afterwards revived with distinctness and through the disciples they were brought vividly before the new converts who were added to the church and the saviour was speaking also to the pharisees he did not relinquish the hope that they would perceive the force of his words many had been deeply convicted and as they should hear the truth under the dictation of the holy spirit not a few would become believers in christ the pharisees had tried to bring christ into disrepute by accusing him of mingling with publicans and sinners now he turns the rebuke on these accusers the scene known to have taken place among the publicans he holds up before the pharisees both as representing their course of action and as showing the only way in which they can redeem their errors to the unfaithful steward his lord's goods had been entrusted for benevolent purposes but he had used them for himself so with israel god had chosen the seed of abraham with a high arm he had delivered them from bondage in egypt he had made them the depositories of sacred truth for the blessing of the world he had entrusted to them the living oracles that they might communicate the light to others but his stewards had used these gifts to enrich and exalt themselves the pharisees filled with self-importance and self-righteousness were misapplying the goods lent them by god to use for his glory the servant in the parable had made no provision for the future the goods entrusted to him for the benefit of others he had used for himself but he had thought only of the present when the stewardship should be taken from him he would have nothing to call his own but his master's goods were still in his hands and he determined to use them so as to secure himself against future want to accomplish this he must work on a new plan instead of gathering for himself he must impart to others thus he might secure friends who when he should be cast out would receive him so with the pharisees the stewardship was soon to be taken from them and they were called upon to provide for the future only by seeking the good of others could they benefit themselves only by imparting god's gifts in the present life could they provide for eternity after relating the parable christ said the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light that is worldly wise men display more wisdom and earnestness in serving themselves than do the professed children of god in their service to him so it was in christ's day so it is now look at the life of many who claim to be christians the lord has endowed them with capabilities and power and influence he has entrusted them with money that they may be co-workers with him in the great redemption all his gifts are to be used in blessing humanity in relieving the suffering and the needy we are to feed the hungry to clothe the naked to care for the widow and the fatherless to minister to the distressed and downtrodden god never meant that the widespread misery in the world should exist he never meant that one man should have an abundance of the luxuries of life while the children of others should cry for bread the means over and above the actual necessities of life are entrusted to man to do good to bless humanity the lord says sell that ye have and give alms be ready to distribute willing to communicate when thou makest a feast call the poor the maimed the lame the blind loose the bands of wickedness undo the heavy burdens let the oppressed go free break every yoke deal thy bread to the hungry bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked cover him satisfy the afflicted soul go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature these are the lord's commands are the great body of professed christians doing this work alas how many are appropriating to themselves the gifts of god how many are adding house to house and land to land how many are spending their money for pleasure for the gratification of appetite for extravagant houses furniture and dress their fellow beings are left to misery and crime to disease and death multitudes are perishing without one pitying look one word or deed of sympathy men are guilty of robbery toward god their selfish use of means robs the lord of the glory that should be reflected back to him in the relief of suffering humanity and the salvation of souls they are embezzling his entrusted goods the lord declares i will come near to you to judgment and i will be a swift witness against those that oppress the hireling in his wages the widow and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right will a man rob god yet ye have robbed me but ye say wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings ye are cursed with a curse for ye have robbed me even this whole nation go to now ye rich men your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you 
ye have heaped treasure together for the last days ye have lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton behold the hire of the labours who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud crieth and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the lord of sabaoth every one will be required to render up his entrusted gifts in the day of final judgment men's hoarded wealth will be worthless to them they have nothing they can call their own those who spend their lives in laying up worldly treasure show less wisdom less thought and care for their eternal well-being than did the unjust steward for his earthly support less wise than the children of this world in their generation are these professed children of the light these are they of whom the prophet declared in his vision of the great judgment day a man shall cast the idols of his silver and the idols of his gold which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth make to yourselves friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness christ says that when it shall fail they may receive you into the eternal tabernacles god and christ and angels are all ministering to the afflicted the suffering and the sinful give yourself to god for this work use his gifts for this purpose and you enter into partnership with heavenly beings your heart will throb in sympathy with theirs you will be assimilated to them in character to you these dwellers in the eternal tabernacles will not be strangers when earthly things shall have passed away the watchers at heaven's gates will bid you welcome and the means used to bless others will bring returns riches rightly employed will accomplish great good souls will be won to christ he who follows christ's plan of life will see in the courts of god those for whom he has laboured and sacrificed on earth gratefully will the ransomed ones remember those who have been instrumental in their salvation precious will heaven be to those who have been faithful in the work of saving souls the lesson of this parable is for all every one will be held responsible for the grace given him through christ life is too solemn to be absorbed in temporal or earthly matters the lord desires that we shall communicate to others that which the eternal and unseen communicates to us every year millions upon millions of human souls are passing into eternity unwarned and unsaved from hour to hour in our varied life opportunities to reach and save souls are open to us these opportunities are continually coming and going god desires us to make the most of them days weeks and months are passing we have one day one week one month less in which to do our work a few more years at the longest and the voice which we cannot refuse to answer will be heard saying give an account of thy stewardship christ calls upon every one to consider make an honest reckoning put into one scale jesus which means eternal treasure life truth heaven and the joy of christ in souls redeemed put into the other every attraction the world can offer into one scale put the loss of your own soul and the souls of those whom you might have been instrumental in saving into the other for yourself and for them a life that measures with the life of god weigh for time and for eternity while you are thus engaged christ speaks what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul god desires us to choose the heavenly in place of the earthly he opens before us the possibilities of a heavenly investment he would give encouragement to our loftiest aims security to our choicest treasure he declares i will make a man more precious than fine gold even a man than the golden wedge of ophir when the riches that moth devours and rust corrupts shall be swept away christ's followers can rejoice in their heavenly treasure the riches that are imperishable better than all the friendship of the world is the friendship of christ redeemed better than a title to the noblest palace on earth is a title to the mansions our lord has gone to prepare and better than all the words of earthly praise will be the saviour's words to his faithful servants come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world to those who have squandered his goods christ still gives opportunity to secure lasting riches he says give and it shall be given unto you provide yourselves bags which wax not old a treasure in the heavens that faileth not where no thief approacheth neither moth corrupteth charge them that are rich in this world that they do good that they be rich in good works ready to distribute willing to communicate 
laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Then let your property go beforehand to heaven. Lay up your treasure beside the throne of God. Make sure your title to the unsearchable riches of Christ. Make to yourself friends by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when it shall fail, they may receive you into the eternal tabernacles. End of chapter 27